morning. I found out after I volunteered to do this morning lesson that John Evans was going to speak, and I really would have swapped with him if I'd have known. I think I'm going to have to retire from amateur preaching. Uh, I found out as, I, as I've gotten older that uh, I've suddenly become the elderly, elderly gentleman rather than just the gentleman. <laughs> and, uh, and I've joined that famous club called the 4-H Club for Older Men. You're wondering what that 4-H Club is. Well, the first is I'm losing my hair. The second, I'm losing my hearing. The third, I'm losing my health. But fourthly, I'm getting a better sense of humor so I can cope with the other three. <laughs> my lesson this morning is entitled Conditions of the Heart. We've all heard the terms hard-hearted, cold-hearted, warm-hearted, soft-hearted, and broken-hearted. We know these terms are not meant to represent the actual physical heart of a human being, but rather a condition arising from the emotional center or the state of mind of a person. A cold-hearted or hard-hearted person is one who is not easily touched by the problems of others. They don't get emotionally involved The soft or warm-hearted person is a person that cares about others' needs. And of course, no physical heart can actually break, although you don't want to tell that to some of these young lovers and when they break up. But rather, it's the condition of melancholy caused by something like a breakup of a relationship. The Bible itself addresses conditions of the heart. In fact, the pages of Scripture are filled with examples. For the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is look at some examples of what the Bible represents as conditions of the heart. And then when we're through, we have time to examine our own hearts. First, when you think of the term hard-hearted and you think about characters in the Bible, who's the person you think of when you think of hard-hearted? I'll bet that the majority of you will have the same thought I had, and that's the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt, the famous hard heart. In Exodus, the seventh chapter, the eighth chapter, and the ninth chapter, we read of the plagues which befell the Egyptian people because of the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. Now, here's a trivia question for you. Do you know how many plagues there were? If you said less or more than 10, you were wrong. There were 10 plagues. Now, the other question is, how many of them can you name? And you don't have to say it out loud. I had to go back and read it a couple of times. Every time I try to do it, I miss a couple of them. So there were 10 plagues in all. Now, the dictionary definition of a hard-hearted person is one who is pitiless and cruel. And that sounds kind of like the Pharaoh. It took 10 plagues before he let the children of Israel go. And even then, he pursued them to bring them back. Now, I don't know about you, but if you remember what these plagues were, I think probably I would have let them go after the first plague when all the water turned to blood. That would have been enough for me. And definitely by the sixth plague, when everyone was covered with boils, but he was hard-hearted. He was pitiless and he was cruel even to his own people because he didn't care how much they suffered. Another heart condition mentioned in Scripture is the wicked heart in Proverbs, the 26th chapter, and verse 23. Fervent lips with a wicked heart are like earthenware covered with silver dross, kind of like a wolf in sheep's clothing is the idea I get from that. This is a person who seems sincere on the outside, but they're hiding wicked thoughts and schemes on the inside. 
Another type of heart is found in Proverbs, the 17th chapter, in verse 20. He who has a deceitful heart finds no good, and he who has a perverse tongue falls into evil. A person with a deceitful heart is akin to the same person with a wicked heart, hiding their true nature behind a cloak of lies. I always think of used car salesmen when I think of this. I don't, want to, I don't know if anybody's a used car salesman. I don't mean to talk bad of you. But that's what I always think of when I think of these, these people. A heart of stone is mentioned in Ezekiel, the, 20, the 36th chapter in verse 26. And this had to do with the condition of the people of God's people's hearts after they had become, uh, had they fallen away and turned to idols. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I think of when a person turns away from God, I think of people I've known in the past that have been faithful. And it seems that their heart does turn to stone. They're not, they're not, you can't touch them anymore. You can't reach them. They've turned their back on God, and, and it seems like there's nothing you can do to make them come back. That's what I picture when I think of a heart of stone. Another type of heart is mentioned in the Bible is in Job, the 23rd chapter. And this is described as a weak heart. And Job says him, him, he himself has this weak heart when he says, talking about God, but he is unique. And who can make him change? And whatever his soul desires, that he does. For he performs what is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. Therefore I am terrified at his presence. When I consider this, I am afraid of him. For God made my heart weak, and the Almighty terrifies me. When you think of the awesome power of God, sometimes it might be enough to terrify you. Especially if you're not in a right relationship with God. But God's power is so immense and so awesome, it's just, you can't even consider it in worldly terms when we think of power. And Job recognized that. He recognized when he was in the presence of God how awesome God was, and it actually terrified him. It made his heart weak. In Ezekiel, the 13th chapter in verse 22, we find the term sad heart. This was in reference to the prophets who prophesied falsely to God's people and caused the people's heart to be sad. Because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. And you have strengthened the hands of the wicked so that he does not turn from his wicked way to save his life. In contrast, David professes to have a glad heart in Psalm 16. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my joy rejoices. And later on, David himself would instruct his son Solomon to have a loyal heart. First Chronicles, the 28th chapter and verse 9. As for you, my son Solomon, know that the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intents of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. This is a passage I like to go to every once in a while just to remind myself when it says, the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. Makes you want to be very careful about what you think because God knows what you're thinking. So even though you might say things on the outside and people see a different person, God knows what's in here. So we want to keep that in mind. The Bible does address the broken heart, but not in the sense that the world uses it. In Psalms, the 34th chapter, in verse 18. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart 
and save such as have a contrite spirit. The terms broken and contrite in the biblical sense mean to have a penitent or repentant heart, a heart that's willing to admit wrongdoing and repent of it. And that's the very reason why David was called a man after God's own heart, not because David was a perfect person. David made many mistakes, but God knew that, da that David's heart was true and pure, and he always returned to God, and he always confessed his sins, and he always asked God for forgiveness. The Bible does mention a merry heart a couple of times, but only in, context, in the context of being drunk with wine, so I hope none of us have merry hearts today. True heart, another term the Bible uses. In Hebrews 10th chapter, verses 22, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he whose promise is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up, good, stir up love and good works. 1 Timothy, 1st chapter and verse 5, Paul discusses the commandment to love and says it must come from a pure heart. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk. As you can see, the scripture addresses the topic of heart conditions a lot. Some are negative admonitions, that is, don't have a hard heart like Pharaoh, don't have a wicked heart, don't have a heart full of deceit, and others are positive, do have a loyal heart, a true heart, a pure heart, and yes, even a broken heart. There's one heart that I pray none of us ever have, though, and that's found in Hebrews, the third chapter and verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. I always have a problem when I read this passage because I realize that the writer of Hebrews is not talking to non-Christians, but he's talking to Christians. And I say, well, how can you be a Christian and have a heart of unbelief? And by going back to Psalms, the 95th chapter, I think of the children of Israel and how they rebelled against God. And in verse 7 says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion as in the day of trial in the wilderness when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though, so though they saw my work. Now, that's the, when it gets right there. They tried me, though they saw my work. They had seen God's work. They were not unbelievers. They believed in God. And yet they had a spirit of unbelief. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Of course, the rest that they were talking about then was the promised land. And because they didn't, they had a heart of unbelief, a whole generation did not get to see that promised land. They did not enter that rest. The same thing can happen to us today. We can be Christians. We can be believers in God. But we can still have a heart of unbelief and to the extent that we don't believe everything that God says is going to happen. We don't believe that we can be sent to hell, maybe. Some people believe once saved, always saved. They believe in God, but they believe wrongly to think that they can't be lost. And we, we can sometimes believe in God and we claim to be Christians, but we don't have that heart, that true heart, and that loyal heart, and that pure heart to believe completely. So we'd still have a, a heart of unbelief. And we don't want to miss out on our rest because 
as the children of Israel missed out on the promised land, our promised land is heaven. And that's what we will miss if we don't have the right kind of heart. And in Ezra, the seventh chapter in verse 10, which we just read, it said, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinance in Israel. So there's something that requires preparation. You have to prepare your heart to seek God. You have to look inwardly and make preparations. It's just like every day, when every Sunday morning when we come to church, we prepare ourselves to go to church. Hopefully we prepare by clearing our minds of worldly thoughts and so we can take in God's word. But serving God requires a preparation. It's, it's not something that just comes naturally. You have to prepare your heart and prepare your mind to serve God. So that's what we have to do every day of our lives. It's not a one-time thing. It's not a once saved, always saved. It's not I believe and that's it. It requires preparation. Sin is a thing that keeps us from being pure-hearted, true-hearted, loyal-hearted. And everyone has sin in their lives. Your heart condition may not be right because of that sin. You may have something in your life that's keeping you from being the kind of person you ought to be. And there are some people that say they believe in God, but because they haven't prepared their heart, they have never been baptized. They have never taken this final step that requires you to give your life over to, to God. If you're here and you've never been baptized, but you know what you need to do, and you profess that you believe in God, then you need to prepare your heart and prepare your mind to do just that, to turn your life over to God by being baptized into it. The majority of us here, though, are Christians, and we have to be careful every day that we don't have that heart of unbelief, that every day we prepare our minds and hearts to serve God in a way that would be pleasing to him. And if we have sin in our lives that are keeping us from doing that properly, then we have to confess that sin. If it's a public sin, it has to be confessed in a public manner. If it's not, you just need to confess that sin to God. Just quickly, I want to reinforce the hard-hearted part. When I go back and read the 7th, 8th, and ninth chapter and I read about Pharaoh and I read about all the plagues that befell him, I think of how easy it is to say we believe but really our hearts aren't there. They're not with God. And I think how easy it is to harden your heart to the needs of those around you and become a hard-hearted person. I think it, how, hard, how easy it is to not take God seriously and realize just what God's capable of doing for you, but also what God is capable of doing to you. So if you're here today, I want you to take the opportunity to look at your own heart. Make sure that your heart is not hard in any way. Make sure that you don't have an unbelieving heart. Make sure that your heart is warm and soft and receptive to God's word. And if you need his help in any way, if you need to be baptized, if you need to get the forgiveness of your sins, now is the time to do it while we stand together and sing.